Welcome to the Product Design Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Coolen, founder of UX Cabin, where we create world-class web and mobile apps. I'm excited to bring you a behind-the-scenes look into the lives of some of the most interesting and talented people in product design. We'll get strategic advice on how they got to where they are today and things they wish they would have known earlier in their career. All right, what's up, everybody? Today we have Matthias Fiore. He is our lead product designer here at UX Cabin, and we're super pumped to have you here, man. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, man. It was long overdue. Uh, I was going to so, say. Yeah. You have, We've planned this since like November of last year, something like that, or even before. You've been a hard one to track down, so <laughs> we're, I know, we're I know. privileged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you live, and what you do? Hmm? Yeah, sure. So basically, I'm a designer. I live in Uruguay. That's the small country in between Argentina and Brazil. I've been doing this since I'm 20, and I'm 34 now. So it's been, it's been a while. So basically, yeah, I, I started very young because I, I, I have a bachelor in graphic design, so I went to university. When I was 18, I was out of high school and I started studying graphic design. So I have a traditional background and yeah, because I am a visual person, I have a photographic memory and I like images and like, I have like a natural tendency towards that. So the husband of my sister, he was an architect and he advised, I, I didn't know what to do. So he advised me to study something related to visual arts or graphic design. And she showed, she showed me a couple of flyers from local universities. And I didn't know that those professions existed or anything like that. So I was like, yeah, this is like, this sounds like something that I would like to study, right? Because another thing about myself is that I kind of like many things and, but I had to decide one. So I could have done all the things also, but it happens that this is one of the things that I love the most. I went to university when I was 22, I was out. So I joined a local advertising agency. I, I kind of didn't like advertising. It wasn't for me. And also the pay was so little back then that I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to start doing my own thing. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to start work. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start to try to work for people I know, like local businesses and, and people like friends who, who happens to have a business. And I started doing that and I was doing pretty much the same amount of money than being a, the employee of an advertising agency. And the experience was much, much better. And I got to learn a lot. So soon after that, soon after I, I got started with working with my own clients, we founded a, a graphic design studio which still exists, but in a different format. We two friends of university, we, we founded this studio that I'm talking about. And like, we kind of expanded our, our services because we were more now we were three. So we rented a small office and we started working full time. And it was quite a struggle at the beginning. And after the first year, we got a couple of clients like regionally from Brazil and United States and England. And we did like many, many, many types of projects. We had our own silk screen printing workshop. So we worked for rock bands, creating the designing and printing rock posters. We also designed the covers for books. We designed magazines, all sort of uh, graphic design stuff, like the traditional stuff that you create when you work in a graphic design studio. And, and it was great. We, we learned like a lot. And then each one of us kind of moved on in, in our own direction, each one of us. So yeah, I moved to Australia and we were already working in the software industry because in parallel to all of these, we were involved in software projects because in Uruguay, the software industry, it's kind of a big thing. So you always know someone who happens to be working in the software industry and the three of us loved uh, interfaces and software in general. I remember myself when I was little and uh, yeah, I got my first computer. It was a uh, Windows 3.11. And then I was always excited with, with the next uh, OS update with the next Windows. And then I got the, an iPod and then my first Mac and everything was like, I loved all of that. Like every single 
new update in the UI. I was thrilled by it. So it felt also like a natural shift from tr traditional graphic design to, to product, to software industry. And at the same time, I never stopped working on traditional graphic design because I still do branding and illustration and some stuff here and there. So I consider myself a designer above all. So it happens that now I'm specialized in product and I'm doing that with like most of my time is being invested in, in learning and working in pro design. And yeah, that, that, that's kind of mean and natural. Tell us a little bit about what it's like living in Uruguay and what are some of the different design scenes there? Is it uh, a ton of designers there or are you kind of like uh, few and far between and kind of just like a little bit of the life around there? Yeah, sure. So basically, it, it's, it's a very interesting place. It's a very small country. We're only three and a half million people. And um, there's no a lot to do here. And like, there are not many industries, but it happens that the, the software industry is a big thing. So you, there are a lot of UX designers around here and a lot, a lot of software engineers. And there's also like a traditional graphic design scene with cool studios that are like from my generation. Like it's, it's pretty interesting what they're doing, but the industry is very slow because it's a thing of the, this, this market. It's like, there's not too many people. So there's quite a few limitations when, when it comes to grow your business, but, but thanks to, to internet, like things are much, much more smooth now, like this in the same way that I am working uh, remotely and I have been working remotely for quite a few years now, uh, a lot of people is doing that and the tech industry allows that and kind of is, is super compatible with that. So yeah, and, and Uruguay as a country is like super interesting in terms of like landscapes and, and like architecture and especially the capital. Montevideo has like a really, really, really good architecture. It has this European vibe, mostly because of the culture and the architecture. And also we, we have like a very nice, the coastline. So it's like, it's five blocks from, from where I live. It's nice, beautiful. And if you want to go down east, you can go to some seaside the towns that are super beautiful and all. And yeah, and we have really good internet, which is like, it sounds like <laughs> something that, uh, yeah, every country has really good inter internet. But once you start like traveling or around, you understand that that's not the reality for every single country. So it is kind of an advantage that allow you to, to have your own business while you are like working for all the countries, right? From yeah. That's cool. How did you know that you wanted to go into design? Was it kind of just like a lucky guess or were there things all along your childhood that you kind of knew from like high school that you wanted to get into graphic design? Yeah, since I was a little boy, I liked like everything visual. I loved like the intros of cartoons and I loved like movie posters. And I like going to the cinema and I like logos. I really liked logos when, when I was watching a show or something on the t on TV, like I really liked like the, the personality of each show embedded in a, in a logo, that type of thing. So it was, it was something that it was pretty natural to, to me when I was a kid. I, I didn't know anything about the designer and I didn't see things with a designer's mindset, but uh, I was so interested in, in the visual side of things that I think it was something that it happened very natural to me. And then I had a little push from my sister's husband. Like, uh, like I said, he, he advised me to study design and showed me these flyers and everything. And I was like, oh, this is pretty much aligned with my, yeah. my, my natural, like the tendencies. Did you get any pushback from other friends or family that thought you were just going to be like a starving artist or like there's no money in it or anything like that? I think I didn't because universities put graphic design like in a way that you see it as a way of making an income. And then it's not as true, but like I can go deeper into that subject in a minute. But like the, the way that they describe the degree and, and like say how it's going to be sound like you can make a living out of it. Yeah. So it sounded like you were going to work for major advertising agencies and like any normal person see advertising on TV, right? So I didn't have that much pushback, yeah. to be honest. And I was lucky because of that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
So, yay. So you started your studio with some friends and learned a lot along the way. Thinking about where you are today, and we'll kind of fill in the gaps a little bit here, but what mistakes did you make back then that you look back and you're like, oh, if only I had known this, I would have been so much better. If I think about like myself back then, and I think I was too worried about having some, some, some success. And I think that when you're young, when you're in your twenties and you, you don't have the pressure to pay a lot of bills and you have kids and like a house and a mortgage, whatever responsibilities that come with adulthood, when you don't have that and you're in your twenties and you're just learning something that you like, I would say just, just chill a little bit more. If you aren't relaxed already, just try to relax a little bit because that first uh, stage of your life, it's going to be all about experimenting and learning and making mistakes. And, and I was too hard on myself in the way that I evaluated my, my performance and the outcome of what I did. It was, a, I was a little bit too hard on myself and I'm still a little bit hard on myself, but it's different now. We're yeah. working for big clients and all of that. And so, so it's, it's a different thing. You have more pressure, but it, like. I would say that I'm less hard on myself now than I was when I was younger, which is something that I'm not proud of it. So that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, just try to learn to love what you're doing instead of always pursuing what you think is going to be your ideal. And that's something that I did right, I think, because only like some clients weren't like the best clients to work with either because of budget or their businesses wasn't like the best in terms of like what you can do visually with it, right? And another way to put it is like, it's great to work for a coffee shop, right? Because you have this special coffee and like uh, the pastry and all that. And then they might have a shop that is looks super nice. And they have like a, a coffee machine that is great, kind of vintage looking and everything. And then designing a visual identity for it or the menu, that, that's great. But if you're designing a logo for a lawyer's firm, not that it's anything wrong with a lawyer's firm, but it's like you, you, you have less to play with and right. you're not going to create something outstanding out of it. So, but if you, if you kind of change your mindset and you try to love that thing that you're doing, you actually gonna be enjoying a lot working on that little logo because you, this is more like you put yourself in a in a position where you kind of abstract yourself from the rest of the noise and you're just focusing on creating a great logo. And it happens to be for a lawyer's firm. That's that's kind of my point. Like yeah. learning to love whatever thing you're doing. And and I think that this is valid for anything. If you're not working as a designer or or like if you're working, washing the dishes in a coffee shop, if the people that you're working with is cool people and everything, and, and it happens that you like the coffee and you're there, just try to enjoy it and try yeah. to do as best as you can. Yeah, I think that's really good advice because even like, no matter what project you're working on, there's always something that you can learn from it. There's always something that like can make you better and always an opportunity to build onto your skill set, right? Like it might be the most boring project in the world, but maybe this project, you can take a little bit more energy to put into like file organization or clear communication or, you know, some sort of like form factor of design that you want to like experiment with and play with. And I think if you're focused on the craft and improving your craft and you enjoy that, then that's going to like build upon itself for your long term. And if you just get like 1% better every project, you're going to have like a wild amount of talent in a few years after going through that exercise numerous times. And I think it's just being aware of that, that like, okay, this isn't the sexiest project or this isn't the the most exciting thing I could ever be doing, but I can still hone my craft a lot over the next three, six, nine months. Yeah, I agree. That, that's an excellent way to put it. And it's also like it's part of becoming the best version of yourself. Like if you're trying to do as best that you can with every opportunity, it adds up to the bigger picture. It's not only about you being... Uh, 
a professional or someone who works uh, at a certain we, uh, in a certain job, like in a certain industry. It's more about like I'm here now, so why not doing the best I can? So the world is a, a better place. Just by a little bit, you're just one yeah. person. There's a lot of people in this world. It's just like you can make this world a better place. And I'm and I'm not talking like this. You're you're not gonna end war, right? right. But I'm saying that the people that that just just from a, a practical point of view, the people that you work with is going to be happier. This is kind of contagious. So your people is going to be infected with this mindset and approach that you have. Well, at least some people will be. And everything is going to be better just because you're doing better. And it's kind of like, it's, I think it's a, it's a great attitude to have in any place, in any, in any job, Absolutely. In, in anything that you're doing, actually, like you've been with a hobby, right? Absolutely. I, yeah, I think part of the, the benefit of, of having experience in design is you're a lot quicker able to see the patterns of projects and what might be necessary or needed or what skill set you might need to employ. And like the mm -hmm. cool thing about working on a lot of projects over your time frame is like, you have all of this past experience that you can pull on and you have all of these design patterns in your mind that you can employ. Maybe even if it's an exciting project, you can still be like, oh, well, I really like that account settings page that we did for whoever. And you can pull it in and it's like, it all kind of just yeah. builds on each other, which is which really, really cool concept. But I would be interested from your perspective, like over your years of starting out, and where you were actually like working and doing good work and being young, what's the difference between Matthias now working on projects versus Matthias like 10 years ago working on projects and what's changed or what's better in, in the new version? Uh, that's a good question. I never thought about it in those terms, but I, I think I know because I know myself and I knew myself back then. So way faster, that's, it's part of what you were saying. like. Because of the experience, you don't have to think or explore as much because in your mind, you can, you can have a much better idea of what's going to work. And it doesn't mean that you always know the solution, but it means that anything you, you need to do is going to require less exploration. So yeah, that's one thing. I'm much faster, more relaxed. Now I know that it's not the end of the world. And because I'm faster, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the deadlines. I never yep. miss a deadline now. And, and before when I was learning, like it wasn't my intention to meet a, de a deadline, but I miscalculated the, right. the time that I <laughs> needed to complete a task. Right. <laughs> so that's another thing. And also like, I think that we, we generally learn how to be more articulated with ideas and that makes everything smoother. And you learn like you put together as a series of steps, let's say that can, that can work as a framework or, or as a methodology to approach to problem solving by acquiring this skill or this skill set, things go much, much more, more smooth because let's say you have a, a meeting with a stakeholder. Now you know how to deal with stakeholders and now you know how to ask the right questions and now you know how to give the right answers or at least like you, you're better at r responding and articulating the, the, your reasoning and your ideas behind the proposal, behind the, the stuff that you're working on. Yeah, there's all of the human interaction elements that goes into project work, working with teammates, working with clients. And you have to be able to understand people and understand different hierarchies, right? So it's like, you need to know who do you need to convince in the room of your idea or your methodology or your point of view? Who do you need to get buy-in from? Who do you need to listen to that knows the system that's giving, you know, the requirements, all those like soft skills that you need to navigate in addition to like being good at drawing rectangles and, and stuff. And again, to what we were talking about earlier, it's like, you just got to sit in like 50 different meetings with people and, and know like what kind of characters are in there and, and what makes people tick and, and how to communicate with, with people. And 
yeah do you have any advice on like the soft skill portion of like dealing with people in design yeah i think that that you should always be respectful but at the same time very transparent with the feedback but you need to do that in a way that sounds kind of logical and uh, well thought because it's not only like having the right manners and sharing your opinion is the way it, it's is the way they shared those opinions right. like you you need to back up your opinions with with your reasoning and 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 possibly with some theory and now we have a lot of tools right like we can we can actually test some options we can test prototypes and we can gather up some some data and back up our decisions with that like with with traditional graphic design that's a much much harder task because it's more opinionated and m- much more nuanced if you have a client and he has his own business and he's putting his money into it and he has an emotional attachment to it it's going to be right. it's going to be a very hard task to convince him that the the thing that you're proposing is the best approach is the best option available and also from the subjective side of things it it is not because you also have your biases and if you're good at what you're doing like even if it's a subjective thing his ideas because he doesn't he doesn't have like the knowledge and the experience to kind of interact with that option that you are trying to propose then it's usually kind of like more common that you as a designer especially if you have experience your proposal your ideas are going to be a little bit better for his business because you're considering a lot of things that are kind of like non tangible and hard to explain and i think that going back to the original idea understanding how to explain these decisions that you're making is helping the client understand and i don't like like saying educate the client and all of that because i think that's a little bit condescending like i'm not trying to ed- educate in anyone i'm just trying to explain what i'm doing every time that i share the reasons behind the, the decisions that i'm making so yeah it's more about like um helping understand the older person why you're making this decision so th- there's a balance of being articulated and being very technical but also not not super technical because some of the terms that you're going to be using only because you study that you you spend a lot of time like learning this concept so the other person you can't expect that the other person is going to is going to know those concepts or yeah are going to relate those words that you're saying with those concepts so it's kind of a balance of being like yeah Uh, yeah, I think everyone at their core wants to feel heard, whether it's a teammate or a client. And I think it's very easy to jump to the end and kind of explain all of the reasons and all of the things that you might want in your particular vision of something. But if you're not speaking to that person's priorities and what they've mentioned, what they've said, and you're not taking that into consideration it almost doesn't matter how good your design is because people will feel like you're ignoring them or you're not taking into account the things that they've said and mm. something i always try to do is whether it's a client or a teammate or a family member and i'm not always good at it but like put yourself in the shoes of that person understand what they're dealing with where they're coming from and try to position whatever the solution is or the answer is in a way that starts from their point of view. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. It's like it. And I'm I, I'm the same like I'm not always successful at doing that. Just <laughs> but I know that that's the way, right? You right, try to right. uh, uh, your best, right? And also like I I think it's it's really important to not to be the the patronizing or condescending with the other person during the conversation the other person doesn't have to know that you're being patronizing or condescending but they can sense it yep and that kind of growing the whole communication instance that you're having with that person so it's more about being like authentic but not authentic because you're dyeing your hair or you're using a, a cool shirt i'm talking about like you're being authentic because you're being honest and and transparent in the way that you, that, you, that you talk you're not trying to hide anything you're just trying to do your best and people can sense that in my experience at least like mm-hmm. uh, i guess that you're very good manipulator or liar <laughs> get away with it right <laughs> 
Yeah, but absolutely. It, I, I think that in general, like the the more transparent you are in, and again, I don't want to say with transparent, like being right. super insulting. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm being transparent be, in in an edu- educated way. Like uh, you're being transparent in a way that shows a respectful approach to the other person. Right, right. Yeah, it's always funny when people, when everyone has that friend who just says it like it is. And a lot of people see that as like a virtue, but it's like, no, this mm-hmm. This guy just doesn't have a filter, so he he can't see more than like than two sentences in front of his face. So he just says what's on his mind, and so yeah, I think to your point, what you say and how you say it, what how you say it is probably a lot more important than what you actually say. That's a great piece of advice for designers, especially. So we kind of have a cool history, you know, going back to when we first started to working together. Maybe you could give the listeners a little like insight as to like how we met and how we started working together back years ago. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's an interesting story. I was back from Australia, right? And I wanted to work remotely from here for a little bit. I I really love the flexibility of remote working. And I know that you're missing some of the human part of it, like the human interaction. But I think that flexibility is like so good that you can even overcome those missing pieces. So... I decided to start working remotely from here. I wanted to work for the U.S., although I, I did have my clients from, from the U.S. Or, or already I wanted to make it more official and do it more because I like the working culture and everything and like the way that clients that treat you. Now it's like kind of about my everyday life, but back then was like, was a new thing and something that I really enjoyed and I wanted to to make it official and something that it was like my everyday life, that type of, of relation and work ethics and all that. Yeah. So I was looking for some freelancing work as a contractor. I already had some clients, but it was just a few hours uh, a week. We were in a Slack channel from Folio, which was this platform for, for freelancers where they posted referrals and job opportunities and all of that, right? Yeah. And I don't remember how it happened that you were looking for a logo because you had like some sketches from another designer and you were starting to build your own agency and you needed a, a logo and I had the time to do it. And the, the task was pretty simple because you already knew yeah, kind of what you wanted. And uh, yeah, we ended up working. That was our first small project. And then you asked me, do you do UI by any chance? And I was like, yeah, I've been doing this for a few years already. And I, like, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, then we started on our first, on our first UX project together. And that was the beginning of a long story. It's been more than two years now. Yeah, that's funny. It was, so Matthias lays claim to the official UX cabin logo. So yeah, that's one of my favorite logos and but as good as Matthias is of a product designer, he's, I would say, equally as good a logo designer. We just, we, we don't have as much of that to pass around these days. But I always remember that was our first project and that was kind of fitting as far as the relationship goes because we've been able to to work together since like middle or early like 2019, I think. And you've kind of been here the whole way to see things grow, which has been really fun. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how things have grown and changed both at the company side, but also for you as a designer. To add to that story, I remember when we, the first few months that we were working together for, for some of the clients, we, we used to have these little fights about like the corner radius of a container <laughs> or like, do, do, you, do you remember that, right? Yeah. It was like, but we were never disagreeing. Like most of the time we weren't disagreeing about like the, the overall experience, but we were having this tiny the things that we were kind of arguing about. And it's funny now that I think of because the business has grown so much, like the, the team is much, much bigger. And like we are spread out across different projects and all. So I think like to your question, one of the changes that I've experienced is like gained a lot of experience. Working at UX Cabin because of the freedom that I have and like, and the quality of the clients, like, I don't think it's that common to have these type of clients that we have because they are very respectful with our work and they kind of love us. And not just 
be, because they, they love us because we are doing great work for them. But still, it's not like a, it's a super common thing to have yeah, this type of client. I agree. So they, <laughs> they allow, they, they kind of allow for growth, right? They kind of let you explore and propose. And even if the, the exact thing that you proposed, that thing that you think is the best option, but doesn't get implemented and you have to work on an alternative, you still had the chance to go, to go and explore and yep. by exploring, by putting time into using patterns and, and, and trying different layouts and having these different versions of the same flow and testing that makes you grow a lot. That's kind of the key of growth as a professional is like, you need to have the chance to explore, to try yep. out things. Totally. Yeah. And <clears throat> I mean, we went from, you know, us kind of just being individual contributors on projects to you kind of being more in uh, almost like a, a half mentorship role, half contributor role, and being able to just like flex those muscles of like, how do I give directions to a teammate? Or how do I coordinate all these things that are like, non-design specific related, but just kind of more management related and, and things like that. Did you ever kind of see, see yourself taking on that kind of role or was that kind of just like new and you just rolled with the punches or what was your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's just a, that, that's a good point because originally with my studio, I was leading the design efforts and also Sometimes we used to hire contractors and those were like mid-weight designers or sure. illustrators. So I did have that, that experience, but not in the tech industry. So it is kind of a different story now, like the way that, that you do it, but there is something, there is like a similar spirit to it. Sure. And, and also I have some experience the teaching the typography and packaging in a local design school. So I did have some background, not as, as intensive as I've been doing in UX cabin because like mentoring junior designers and people who has no design background and starting to learn and everything is kind of like, I feel like I also work in, in some sort of a, a design academy, which is great because <laughs> it makes me kind of think twice everything and like, and I have to remember some principles that I'm applying that are kind of like, I don't even remember what I'm doing that just right. incorporated that into my, my practice and I'm doing that every day without questioning it. And sometimes you'd be surprised learning that some approach that you're using wasn't the best. Right. And, and that's something <laughs> that you can learn while you're trying to teach someone because you gotta be sure of what you're saying or, or teaching. Right. And, and interns and juniors, they, they ask a lot of questions r rightfully because they need to learn. So that makes you learn too. So. Yeah, so it's, it's almost like when they ask, like, why do we do it this way? And you come to something that you don't have a clear answer for, and you're like, huh, why do I always draw my artboards this way? Or why do I always make them this size or use this grid? And then you're just like, hmm, tradition? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't know why I use this corner radius or why, you know, whatever. And you can't just go and then say, and say like, because I want to, okay, right. I want to, I want to do that. And that's it. You can't do that, right? <laughs> So yeah, you, you always have to be respectful of the other person. So you got to go and just double check and remember why you're doing that. And uh, yeah, it is a good exercise and, and I really like it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, to your point about us kind of like squabbling over things in the design, it's funny because like, I, I have like the utmost respect for you as a designer and you're great. You work you know, fantastically. But I do feel like when we work together on things, we squabble and it's nothing personal. It's nothing like whatever, but it's like, I don't know if it's one of those things where it's just like, you're good at leading projects on your own and too many cooks in the kitchen or whatever. It's not like a bad problem, but it's just like a funny thing that like, we, we squabble sometimes on projects. I feel the same about you and I, and I have the same pressures. Like we, <laughs> we, we have that. It's kind of like an ongoing conflict that it's underneath our interactions, but it's like, it's so subtle and it doesn't affect, like we can actually create great stuff and right. deliver it. So it's not a stopper. It's just a, a thing that, that sometimes it comes to the surface and we have to deal with it. And it's like, right. yeah, I think it's, I don't know. I don't I know. I think it's just normal teams, like 
It is normal. Yeah, exactly. Because you're always going to have like, any, any people on the team like a, that like you like work better with or you like to hang out with, but not necessarily work with or whatever. And I think that's just normal team dynamics. And yeah, I don't know. It's funny. And and I think that because the we have such a great culture and and everyone is like nice to each other, what we're talking now is like the worst thing that we ever experienced in our team. Right. And like it it can be so so much worse. You know what I mean? It's like it, it can be it can be horrible, but we don't have any problems with, with, between us. So it's kind of right. like the the tiniest the tiniest little thing feels like like the the bigger problem that we have because it is we don't have all the problems between us so that's right. kind of like yeah 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 totally i think whenever you're working in a team whenever you're working with people there's always things that are outside of like the normal design thing that you have to like interact with you could be the best designer in the world but if you can't like engage with someone work out your problems there's always going to be problems you know but kind of like those people skills that you have to develop and there's going to be people you disagree with and you have to figure out like what's something I want to fight for what's something I want to like chill out on what's something that I feel like I could convince someone if I like just had more time and I think over the long term all of our things get resolved it's just like we'll fight about silly things like corner radius or typography or whatever yeah. that's like yeah exactly does it doesn't matter really to the end client but it's like we're very passionate about as like designers because it's, you know, it's the little details that we care about. But and, and sometimes it feels it feels silly. Do you know these memes that are uh, uh, like on the internet where you see like the world is on fire and yeah. you're just <laughs> arguing about a <laughs> corner radius. So it's like sometimes it feels silly. It's like it's not that important, but it is in our in our realm, like in the right. in the uh conceptual universe that we are they were working on or we were working in it feels real to us and it is but it's like yeah it's not the worst thing in the world it's just a little thing yeah totally totally i'd also be interested in your perspective kind of like what you think people who are trying to get into design what are some like different patterns that you're seeing from either like younger designers or intern level designers or people who are trying to break into ux what are the skill deficiencies and things that they should focus on as they're trying to get their first job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to say now is like my own opinions. Like, sure. and, and there are different approaches to, like there, there are different paths that you can take that are going to take you to the same place or a similar place. So this is like my, based on my experience, I would advise anyone interested in, in being a product designer to be first a designer. like having like a holistic understanding of design. Like, and that means that you kind of like studied a uh, history of arts and crafts in, in, in art and the color theory, but like from not only applied to product, but also like you, you are like studying masterpieces, like paintings and all of that. Like, and you're re reading like the people who better understood it and like you're reading books and everything like and I know that like it's kind of the same when you were in school and they were teaching you math right and they were like I don't I don't need this why I need to learn all of these equations and all of these <laughs> like I'm not gonna use this I, I want to <laughs> do something else but it's not it's not about that now, now I know like I didn't know back then when I was a little kid but it's all about like having a holistic understanding of the things that you're gonna be dealing with once you land a job or you start like working with something like or practicing any anything right so with the sign is the same it's like you in my view, if you want to be a good product designer, you got to learn to design from a holistic pr perspective. And I'm talking about like physical products, like go and study how Brown did with their like electronic appliances, which are like the, the predecessors of Apple. And go and learn like the beginning of Apple industrial design, how they did with their first prototypes and everything. Or, like learn how to, what makes a good logo or poster 
And you don't have to become like a total expert if you're not going to be doing that for a living. But I'm saying that you need to understand like the, the, the basics of all of that before you do product design or you can do it at the same time. Like as long as yeah. you're paying attention to that side of things, like you're showing interest and uh, like learning more and more, I think that's, that's going to be detrimental for anyone to become a good designer. But there are some examples of people who didn't do that and they're excellent product designers. Sure, so sure. It's not, a, it's not like an absolute truth. Like it's full of those examples, actually. Sure. This is just my opinion, like based on my experience. I think that's a really good point because it's kind of like understanding the fundamentals, right? Because like if you take someone who's never shot a basketball and you put them at the, the three-point line and you're like, go for it, it's going to be an awful shot. But it's like if you start doing layups and you're like, showing them the proper way to bend their elbow, bend their wrist, push off with their legs. It's kind of like those foundations of color theory, visual hierarchy, composition, all of those things that Mm -hmm. you can absorb and understand their purpose. I kind of took a different route because I got started in front end development. And then I had to learn all of the principles Mm -hmm. of typography, like on the job, like why does laying it out this way make it better than just one line of text. And like, you know, that took years and years of me just like trial and error. And then coming at the end of it and understanding like, oh, this is visual hierarchy. Okay, now Uh I understand. But but yeah, to your point, I think I've heard that I've heard that from a few people. And I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But again, if it happens that you didn't start it with a like a formal education on design, you can make it up uh, for it. You can you can learn like a lot, and especially nowadays, like you have YouTube and you have like a million right. books that you can buy. You can even have a Kindle and buy like some color theory books that are like mostly text or something. Yeah. That is much more accessible now. Like it was, it was way different when I was studying. Like, and it wasn't like, I'm not that old. It wasn't that long ago. It's just, The world has changed so much in so little time. But yeah, that's, I think that's fantastic advice. Curious to hear what your advice would be to people who are kind of in their first year or so of their career, they've gotten a job. What are the things a product designer in their early, early stages of the career needs to focus on to, to level up? Yeah, I would say that you got to behave like you were a sponge, like try to absorb as much as you can, because some people think like, I, I used to feel this way when I was younger. You feel like I don't have the talent or the skills to do, to make this look good or to nail the pattern selection for the flow that I'm working on. And it's like, actually, nothing's going to come from your insights. If, if you're designing a mobile app, just go and download all the best apps that are Yes. In the, in the market, just go and use those, create accounts, use them, explore them, even, even try to find their flaws and then go and read material guidelines, like as much as you can. The same with, with iOS, go in and, and, and see how these, uh, design systems from major players are, are, are doing with their components and their styles and their constraints, go and learn all of that. And, and even if you're not going to replicate all of those rules like for example with material is that like i think that material is good because it's a very large articulated collection of rules and patterns and they put a lot of effort to to try to make everything work together as a whole system but it doesn't matter that you're gonna be memorizing all of that and using that every single day of your life because even even some of their rules won't apply to your particular use case, but just trying to understand how they did it and why they're doing that will help you to come up with your own thing that might or not, uh, might be the same as what they're doing. And the same with like, uh, aesthetics. I think that that's very important because if you nail the, all the flows and the product is well thought and it's like the business goals are there and everything is, is. It's fine, right? Like you're doing everything by the book and everything. But if it doesn't look good, then people won't want you right. as much, right? Right. So, and, and in order to make something look good, you got to go and see how all of these good looking products are doing. 
right. what are the, the decisions, the visual decisions that they're making, like how they select the colors for some components to, to make some of them stand out more than others. Yep. That's not like based on their guts. They, they're doing that because they want to establish in these hierarchies where some object needs to stand out over the others. And the same with the second level information and whatever is on that screen that you're looking at is not a coincidence. And by trying to replicate what they're doing and trying to analyze what they did, then you're going to learn how to make your own stuff. That's kind of a big advice from my side. It's just go and watch, look, analyze, just poke around with all of these apps in, and even try to replicate the screens and in Figma. Yeah. Yeah. I think pattern recognition is like huge, both stylistically and function. Like you said, understanding iOS guidelines, like what options do I have at this place? Because I think if you approach every feature from like a completely blank slate, you're going to have a hard time. But if you're like, okay, I know that this is a selection list and it could either be a drop down, it could be like a sheet, it could be radio button, like you, you you're like, okay, I have like five different things I could pick from. And then you just like find those five patterns. You think about it, you compare them, you weigh, weigh the pros and cons of either one, and then you refine your decision. But it's not like you have to start from this blank slate. It's like, let's see how this app does it or type it into Dribble and see like what different patterns come up. And to your point of like using material design or whatever as like a baseline, I think those are just awesome places to use as a springboard to research tabs. Like how do tabs look? There's a million different ways you can make a tab look. And then you want to hit your style example. And then so you do research on styles and it's like, okay, does this feel more light? Does this feel more modern? How do I want to take this and where do I want to land this from a form and function standpoint? So it's like, a junior might be thinking like, oh shoot, I have to like memorize all these things. I don't think that's the case. I think over time you will, but I think more importantly is just knowing where to go and where to look and popular apps, Dribble. There's a ton of sites out there that kind of collect these things and, and, and serve them up for you in mm -hmm. like a nice collection. And I would, yeah, to your point, I would just rely on those heavily, study those, have those kind of available to, to pull in and, and to iterate on and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely. I think that's the way. It's like that a kind of blank piece of paper that you have and you have to, out of a sudden, you have to compose something and it, it has to come from from you. And that's kind of not, not the right approach. And this, it can be really frustrating because right. nothing good is going to come out of that. So the the history of design is just an addition of uh, like previous experiences on top of each other. It's like rearranging these uh, moving pieces that we have. It's, it was never like originality doesn't come from just coming up with your own unique thing. It comes from rearranging these moving parts that we already have. And sometimes you are going to come up with new things like new patterns for, for example, the swipe down the pattern to update a view, yep. to refresh a screen, that's something very original and unique. And it's not based on anything that existed before, except like the holistic understanding of how interaction design works. Like you use your fingers and you swipe yep. the down, left, right, that type of interactions. But that pattern is unique, but it's really uncommon that you're going to come up with that sort of patterns. It doesn't yeah. mean that you shouldn't pursue that or you shouldn't try something, but don't get crazy about it because it's more important to do it right than to do it unique. That's, that's not the point. I was going to say on the, like the new pattern thing, if you create something that you've never seen before used in any other app, you are either brilliant and you made a completely new pattern or you probably made something that is not functional and <laughs> shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, man. So in the last few minutes here, kind of wanted to just hash up some some different design label philosophies here with you and get your take on. So we've got like 
we've got UX, we've got UI, we've got product design, we've got all of these different labels and they kind of all mean the same thing. And there's, you know, there's certain people who are saying like, oh, you should just be a UX designer. You should just be a UI designer. What's your hot take on that and kind of the state of where we are in terms of like design labels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good topic of discussion. My opinion regarding this is kind of pretty much aligned with what I said about being a, a designer, like being a, a, a designer first. So this holistic approach to learn and understand something with UI and UX, I think it's kind of the same. I think that you can't divorce UX from, from UI. Those are kind of two sides of the same coin. If you try to, to specialize on one thing, like how can you create a user experience if you don't have a UI? That's an absurd, right? That doesn't exist. So I don't understand why in the industry we're talking about UX and UI as separate things. Although you could be better at UI than sure. UX. Sure. Let's say that you are better doing user research, which is also another thing. You could be a user researcher, but not a UX designer. That's how that happens. We have researchers in our team that are, are not working as designers yep. and uh, we have really good relationships and we, we collaborate all the time. That happens. But when we talk about UX design and UI design, those are integrated and are in indivisible. You can't yeah. separate those. I think. It's the industry has kind of evolved over the last few years and kind of like what we were talking about earlier is like a few years ago, I think we kind of had this phase of like you had a researcher, potentially you had like a UX designer who did like mm. wireframes and then that then got handed over to like a UI designer. And what I'm seeing nowadays is like research is its own thing and then design is its own thing and that that includes both like wireframes to high fidelity mockups. And mm -hmm. I don't think there is a space for someone to just solely do wireframes or solely do information architecture. I, I, obviously there's exceptions, but to break into that as like a new person, a new product is, or a new UXer who's like, I'm not going to do UI. I'm just going to do like this. I think that's going to be very hard. And a good way to position yourself is probably to think of like, what do I want to be a researcher or do I want to be a designer, product designer, UX, UI, mm -hmm. whatever you call it. But yeah, I don't think you can get good at UI without get also getting good at UX and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also, even if your role is more about documenting and uh, clarifying requirements and exploring uh, the flows in an abstract way, even if that's the case, you still need to know about the patterns and you need to know how those flows are going to translate after, because if not, your abstract take on those flows are not going to be compatible with then the execution of the UI layer that is going to be on top of those flows. So basically you still have to know how to do that. So you can build a bridge between what you're doing and the person yeah. who's going to be working on that UI layer. Totally. I think in any team, there's going to be people who have specialties. Like someone might be really good at, you know, prototyping or someone might be extremely good at UI or animation. And it's not like you have to be, be all of those things because we got to lean on each other's strengths and weaknesses. I think it's just one of those things for like people to consider as like a general principle of like, if you're going to be a product designer, you'll want to get good at both the UX, the flows, how it works and, mm -hmm. and the visual side of how it looks, how it feels. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the visual side of things in a UI, it's not art, right? It's like, if you're going to, to design a button, then it needs to look like a button. Right. And so it's still UX. That's UX. Right. <laughs> Totally. So it's about like the, the how the user is going to interact with that visual element and how that's going to be perceived and what's like the previous understanding of that pattern from the user side. That's the, so it's like it's indivisible. It's just I don't. That's how I think. I can't Agreed. separate those two things. <laughs> Agreed. Very much so. 
Well, Matias, this has been great. I appreciate the time that you've given us and the wisdom you've shared. Hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to run it back and do it again. And we're still all here at UX Cabin thriving. But yeah, man, I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. This, this was great. And it would be great if we do it in uh, another time in the future. Absolutely. Alrighty. All right. Have a good one. See ya. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on the Product Design Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure and go follow our guests. Let them know they did a great job and you learned a lot. Um, more to come in the following weeks as we bring on new guests. Please hit that subscribe button so that you will get these podcasts uh, and learn a ton about the product design community. Excited to see you next time. Thanks.